verbally, Iram, just in case anybody can't see the chat? Sure. So, para aquellos que no, uh, que necesiten uh, traducción al español o interpretación, uh, uh, abajo, abajo en su ventana del Zoom, abajo hay, hay una, hay un símbolo como de, de un globo terrestre que dice interpretación. Y, has, y haces clic y aparece una otra ventana y seleccionas uh, español y, y ya vas a poder escuchar la traducción a, al español. Y si quieres no escuchar el, el la versión en inglés, haces clic también en, 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 el, en la ventana que dice silenciar audio original. Thank you, Iram. All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Cervallos. I am the outreach coordinator for the Reclaiming the Border Narrative Digital Archive here at the University of Arizona. We're very, very glad you could join us today to hear from wonderful organizations and artists who are challenging mainstream narratives about the US-Mexico border. Their work is of significance to everyone because what happens along the busiest and one of the most militarized borders in the world impacts us all. Mainstream narratives about the border perpetuate state violence here and abroad along racialized and geopolitically motivated lines. In the US, billions of dollars go to war, to interference in other countries, and to hardening borders. Meanwhile, many are deprived of basic human rights. Migrants, asylum seekers, and the largely Mexican and indigenous communities who live along the border are uniquely impacted by all of this. Our binational communities are often treated as enforcement zones to be militarily policed rather than the places of vibrant cultural exchange that they are or could be. A situation of severely limited civil and human rights continues to expand in the borderlands, and this is backed by Supreme Court precedent. The organizations and artists you will hear from today, however, are telling their own stories. They're wielding artistic and cultural approaches to illuminate the realities, beauty, and complexities of the US-Mexico borderlands and migration. The only way forward is in movement together, so I am extremely grateful to be able to work with these organizations and these artists, and to welcome all of you to this conversation about building narrative power in the borderlands. Before we get started, uh, I just wanna share a couple notes about navigating the Zoom space, and Lorena is opening up the program so that you can follow along. First, if you need support accessing interpretation, turning on your captions or anything else, feel free to ask in the chat and one of our colleagues will gladly help you. Secondly, you may notice we had to extend the time for this event. Instead of the program ending at 2.30, we're going to begin the Q&A at that time. So we apologize for any inconvenience and we hope it doesn't prevent you from joining us for the Q&A. Um, feel free to share your questions for the panelists throughout the event. Uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to address as many of them as possible. Lastly, please note that we are recording this event. Your name will not be visible in the recording, but your video might, so feel free to turn your video off if you prefer that. Now, I'd like to pass the microphone to Professor of Latin American and Border Studies and Director of the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. Dr. Javier Duran, and he'll share more uh, background about the Reclaiming the Border Narrative Project and the Digital Archive. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. In 2020, the University of Arizona Conference Center for Creative Inquiry was approached by Samit Malik and Gabriel Solis, at the time consultants for the Reclaiming the Border Narrative Project, Encourage, encouraging us to submit a proposal as potential archi archival partners. To do so, we created a partnership with our colleagues at the University of Arizona Library Special Collections. The proposal was successful, and in 2021, we began creating the archival team and articulating an outreach strategy. We would like to acknowledge the financial and administrative guidance and support uh, of the Ford Foundation. We're especially thankful to Margaret Morton, Director of Creativity and Free Expression, Lane Harwell, Program Officer of Creativity and Free Expression, and their amazing team. Our thanks to our University of Arizona colleagues in the RBN archival team 
who have worked hard to make this event possible, especially Michelle Ceballos, Lorena Diaz, and Alba Fernandez Keys. As Michelle suggested, for many folks living in the US Mexico borderlands, the mainstream narratives generated about the region represent a distorted and unreal view of what really happens in these communities. It is not an exaggeration to say that the local border narratives have been appropriated, mass mediatized, and even hijacked by several political and economic interests. The border is thus represented in a constant state of chaos and crisis, fitting into an abject imaginary of criminalization and dehumanization of its inhabitants. Many scholars have referred to the existence of a border military industrial complex as one key element guiding these negative representations. Moreover, the region has also become a sort of political piñata used to implement anti-immigrant policies that exacerbates racism and xenophobia, especially during election times. This is not to say that we also face humanitarian challenges produced by those dehumanizing policies. Hence, reclaiming the border narrative, storytelling, and cultural power for migrant justice is a direct response to these forces. It aims to reshape the national attention uh, on immigration and the United States-Mexico border by supporting authentic storytelling by affected communities on the cultural and social political dynamics that comprise the region. The project enables immigrant rights advocates, artists, journalists, writers, and community-based organizations to shape and preserve stories reflecting the dignity and truth of border communities, connecting and empowering them to center their narrative on their own terms and in their own voices. There are 48 grantees for five major partners in this effort, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, Borealis Philanthropy, and the Center for Cultural Power. The, Arizona, the University of Arizona Conference Center for Creative Inquiry and the University of Arizona Library Special Collections serve an important role as the archival partner. As the archival partner, we ensure that the stories and materials generated by the project grantees are digitally preserved, widely accessible to the public, and activated through public programming such as this, our first Frontier Forum. We see the archive as a dynamic and generative space, a site of ongoing dialogue, intersections, and creativity that will be connected to academia and to our partners, cross-disciplinary border programming, community outreach activities, and other resource opportunities. A key component of this synergistic collaboration embedded in the project is the notion of archiving as community building, and perhaps more specifically to Gabriel Solis's idea of archivals of survival. This idea emerges when we consider archives not just mere collections of records or objects, but sites of memory, culture, and history, in particular of marginalized and underrepresented populations. Archivals of survival can actively interrupt cycles of violence and trauma and help distressed communities reclaim and build new empowering strategies. Yet, no archival collection achieves this without the meaningful work of building and nurturing relationships centered on collective care, inquiry, collaboration, resistance, and resilience. Thus, for Solis, a key element of these archives, even, quote, more important than their technical infrastructure is their moral architecture. By centering community and care, archives of survival actualize the relationships we want to see across our communities, relationships built on understanding, truth, and accountability, end of quote. This moral architecture has been a key element in the development of this archival project as our work seeks to elevate regional stories and perspectives and to highlight matters of racial justice, gender equality, and the evolution of these voices within the unique cultural context of the borderlands. Again, I want to welcome you to this event. And now I would like to, uh, my colleague and co-principal investigator in the project, Veronica Reyes Escudero, to say a few words about the project. Gracias. Buenas tardes desde Bloomington, Indiana. Qué placer poder estar aquí con ustedes. Agrego mis gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí con nosotros, especialmente a los participantes del archivo. I'd like to add my gratitude to all of you here today for joining us in our very first Monday forum. To those participating in the discussion today and to our team who've put many hours into the design of this event. I'll share with you that I am at a conference devoted to special collections and archives professionals, of which I am a part. The question of too much vocation in the profession has come up as many are facing near or full on burnout following these years of pandemic, racial reckoning, and the interweaving of our personal and work lives with what seems like no rest. The work that our Ford family is doing, because I've come to believe that to do this work, we must become family, 
absolutely takes vocation. It is awe inspiring what all of you have created. And I know that to do so takes an enormous amount of vocation and dedication, even when it blurs the lines in our lives. But yes, let's take a deep breath and take a moment to recognize that the work we do sometimes, sometimes blurs both figurative and literal lines of life and work, tragedy and joy, celebration and advocacy, and yes, sometimes even life and death. In my remarks, I want to shed light on the significance and profound impact of archives. The Borderlands collections of the University of Arizona Library's Special Collections help to shape the experiences of border and migrant communities. Archives serve as an invaluable repositories of historical records, documents, and narratives that not only chronicle the past, but also hold the power to shape our present and future. They offer a glimpse to the complex, into the complex tapestry of human interactions, revealing the multifaceted dynamics of our border and the experiences of those who live alongside it and traverse them. The digital archive will play a pivotal role in preserving the stories, joy, and struggles of migrant communities. These records capture the lived experiences of individuals who have embarked in, on perilous journeys in search of safety, better opportunities, or reunification with their families. They document the hardships, resilience, and triumphs of those who have traversed borders, leaving behind their homes and unfamiliar surroundings. By safeguarding these narratives, archives honor the dignity and resilience of migrants, ensuring that their voices are not only, not only not lost, but are indeed amplified. It is our hope that the archive will further provide opportunity for learning, affirmation for our students, and perhaps crucial evidence for advocacy and policymaking efforts aimed at improving the lives of border and migrant communities. Archival collections of, of documents, testimonies, and data are instrumental and in enable researchers, scholars, and archivists to analyze historical patterns, identify systemic issues, and propose informed solutions. Archives empower communities and advocates by providing them with the necessary tools to challenge harmful narratives dismantle stereotypes and promote inclusive and compassionate policies that uphold human rights and dignity. Additionally, as Dr. Duran mentioned, archives foster a sense of collective memory and cultural preservation. They serve as repositories for cultural heritage, traditions, and identity, capturing the richness and diversity of humanity. Through the preservation of oral histories, photographs, artwork, and other materials, archives contribute to the recognition and celebration the cultural contributions of migrants and their communities. By preserving these invaluable records, our country enforce a sense of belonging and foster intergenerational connections, bridging the past with the present and the future. Lastly, archives are evidentiary materials. They have potential to facilitate healing and reconciliation processes within our communities. They provide spaces for individuals and communities to reflect on their shared history, acknowledge the past injustices and forge paths towards reconciliation. By creating opportunities for dialogue like this one and more to come, archives enable diverse voices to be heard, fostering empathy and understanding across cultural, social, and maybe even political divides. They contribute to building bridges of solidarity, amplifying marginalized narratives and nurturing collective efforts for more just and inclusive society. Archives hold immense importance and wielded and wield a profound impact on border and migrant communities. They serve as guardians of collective memory, instruments of advocacy, catalysts for policy change, and agents of healing and reconciliation. As we navigate the complexities of borders and migration, let us recognize the vital role of archives and commit to the preservation, accessibility, and amplification. The digital archive moves us to that end. Thank you to the Ford Foundation for their vision and for recognizing and entrusting the University of Arizona as the archival partner to this important initiative. By doing so, we honor the humanity and dignity of all individuals, fostering a more inclusive and compassionate world for future generations. So yes, this work, all of our work does indeed take vocation. And I would like to pass it on to our, uh, to Yadira Caballero, Program Manager at the Confluence uh, Center for Creative Inquiry. Thank you. Uh, Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry, 
look look at the normal law not cry but the screen not is it up on a dash the tray do not cry a dash the nally other bit that the eight are you see not that quite a two song cash if other be it out the next than initially quite a me honey yanny d by a scared ele could all slap say it is they had to be they had a bit a bit so we're gonna bit bizarre uh yes to get As we live in a current moment of transition, we have to continue to understand and reflect the longstanding history and the stories on the land that we currently reside on and the indigenous people presence in land rights in everyday life. Many of us here today are joining from different places that have been deep history of settler colonialism, the profound injustices that indigenous people have endured over centuries and where they have experienced the hands of removal, assimilation, termination, and reorganization from the federal, state, and local level governments, religious institutions, and colonizers. I am joining from the native homelands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the lands of the Paspoyaki tribe. They are the ones whose care and keeping of these lands allows us to be here today. It is a place in relation to the original people of the land and who and who have continued to carry their traditions and cultures. For indigenous peoples, the land is part of who we are. It is part of our identity from our past, where we are here today, and in our, it will continue on to the future. Everything around us is alive. It has a purpose. It is a special place where we are surrounded by plants, animals, and nearby waters, which all have meaning to the original people. We give thanks to the Mother Earth and honor our life to the Creator. We look after the life on the land that is given to us. It is imperative that we continue to carry these reflections where you currently reside and places that you go. We will continue to build our mindfulness of our present participation and listen to the stories that are shared, especially by our elders. Now I will pass it to our moderator for this afternoon, Anita. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Anita Wizar Hernandez. I'm going to be the moderator for our conversation this afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here and to get us started the flow for this conversation. We're going to begin with short presentations by each of our amazing panelists who will talk about their artistic practice and advocacy work. And then we'll move from those presentations into a conversation amongst the panelists about the work that they're doing. And then finally, we'll move to the Q&A session. So do feel free to post questions as they come up while you're watching the uh, presentations in the chat you're, or in the Q&A box. You're more than welcome to put those questions throughout the conversation. And we really look forward to being in dialogue. And yes, this conversation is going to be, it is currently being recorded and will be available to rewatch. And I know I'm very grateful for that, as I'm sure this will be a, a wonderful conversation for us to refer back to. So we are going to get started and begin with Daniel Hernandez, who's with the Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project. He's going to share with us their organization's approach to storytelling. Thanks, Anita. Uh, yeah, hello, my name is Daniel Hernandez. Uh, and as Anita said, I'm the content development manager at the Florence Project. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, the Florence Project is the largest provider of free legal and social services to immigrants facing removal proceedings in Arizona. Our attorneys, legal assistants, and social workers meet with adults in ICE detention and with unaccompanied children in government-run shelters and with families and individuals seeking refuge at the border. We advocate for them to be allowed to remain in the U.S. and assist with other issues that come up in the months or years that it may take to finish their legal proceedings. Everyone has a unique story, and for clients who are interested in sharing their narratives publicly, we take a thoughtful and nuanced approach. Our storytelling centers each individual's feelings, motivation, and voice. Many embrace the opportunity to celebrate rising above the hardships they experienced. They may also wish to call out the injustices that they confronted in their home country and or in the United States. Some do it to help the cause, to feel empowered, 
or to inspire others to persevere through difficulties like persecution and immigration detention. It's important, of course, too, that each person feels empowered and in control of their story. When we present these opportunities, we make it clear that there's no obligation for a client to participate in public comms for a number of reasons that's not for everyone. In some cases, people prefer to only look forward in their storytelling, concentrate on winning their case and moving on to the future, and that's fine too. We also offer to use pseudonyms and will decline to use photos if they're uncomfortable or concerned about their image being shared. We want this narrative storytelling process to be positive. So we use trauma-informed interviewing strategies developed by the social workers on our staff. If while reflecting on their experience, someone feels sad or triggered, we will pause and take a breath and present the opportunity to rede redirect the conversation if they prefer. We also start and end each interview on a lighthearted note. Those moments are important for the story too. When there's joy, humor, or a talent or interest that a person shares, we like to include that. Those are the things that make each of us human. As we work to reclaim the border narrative at the Florence Project, we believe these individual profiles are extremely impactful. We put individual experiences in a broader social and political context, but we also always emphasize individual resilience, personal dreams, bonds with loved ones, and the passions and interests that helped each person endure through uncertainty. We've been honored to share the stories of people who, in addition to being survivors of trauma and persecution, were also a DJ, a folklorico dancer, a ballet performer, a talented guitar player, a soccer player, a baker, a mother, a father, an advocate. Amplifying the details that are specific to each individual also has made their stories more universal and relatable. Our goal is to counter the hopelessness, the othering, the one-dimensional media coverage, and the hateful disinformation that seek to undermine our movement, or which have inadvertently dehumanized migrants by reducing them to the sum of their misfortunes. Simply put, we believe that for the immigrant rights movement to resonate in a way that inspires reforms, we must center the people impacted by these policies, amplify their voices, and allow individuality to shine. We hope that this helps people understand that immigration is not just a political issue, it's a human rights issue and a cause for humanity. In some cases, our client stories read more like life narratives with a border interlude, or like a border narrative with an outlook that projects well beyond detention and immigration court. We write long stories with extensive quotes from both our clients and their Florence Project team. We may request pictures or commission a photo shoot and occasionally we'll make videos or illustrations depending on the medium that best complements the story. As part of this project, we partnered with an art illustration class at the University of Arizona and worked with students to create animated GIFs inspired by our clients' stories. These help us promote our mission and depict our clients' experiences. For example, um, the slide on the left showing a person playing chess with himself in a detention center is inspired by our client Luan, who migrated by himself from Albania as a teenager. Luan was 17 years old when he arrived to the US and was detained by Border Patrol. He had family waiting for him in New York. They called us asking to help in getting him released. Luan turned 18 while in Border Patrol custody and was sent to an adult detention center in Arizona while we worked with him to work to, to get him reunified with his family. He didn't speak Spanish or English and no one else in ICE detention spoke Albanian, so he was extremely isolated and scared, but he found chess pieces and he made a chess board with pen and paper and played chess with himself to distract from his anxiety. One of the artists who depicted Luan's story, Robin, Robin Silverman, said he chose to work on it because when he was a child, he wasn't allowed to play with others. And he said, I really empathize with feeling such intense loneliness that you resort to playing games with yourself. Responses like this validate our approach. There's, there's a famous quote by the psychologist Carl Rogers who said, what is most personal is most universal. The artist, Robin, recognized that he had a very different experience that caused his loneliness and 
many people likewise might not necessarily relate to being forced to flee their home country or and be detained by immigration authorities. But there are feelings and values that everyone can understand and connect with. And that's what we strive for in our storytelling. Um, and that's all for, for me. I'm just thankful to uh, the Ford Foundation and the University of Arizona Special Collections and the Confluence Center for, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing that wonderful work with us. Next, we're going to hear from Evan Apodaca, who is a visual artist. San Diego. San Diego. Of San Diego. San Diego. San Diego. Um, the biggest problem we have with the military economy in, in San Diego is the fact that it absorbs so much land mass. And that is, that becomes a stumbling block because land is important for creating value for creating product. If you look all around, just turn around 360, 360 degrees, and you're gonna see that over two thirds of the area that you're looking at is military controlled. If once American war memorials started to acknowledge their complicity as perpetrators of violence, it might sound like an alarming cacophony of voices. And and the normalization of violence is is part of um, is one of the factors of what is known as low intensity conflict theory, where violence becomes so normalized that people stop questioning it. It becomes part of their daily routines. So as a result, when the planners were looking at it, they were saying, what do we need here in case there's an invasion? Or if Mexico made a treaty with a foreign power like Japan and a Japanese army wound up being supported out of Mexico, what do we need to defend the border from an invasion from the south? In una época que este creciente número de barcos navales quién más sino la gente de sudeste de San Diego incluyendo los residentes del barrio Logan when we're walking around or maneuvering around a military city like San Diego we very much can tell that the story that is being fixed here through monuments is a military history right where um, if we think about it, it's commemorating, it's celebrating the, um, the military interventions as if they are um, battles that have been won rather than thinking of them as commemorating someone that lost something. Bold and beautiful are the shores of California, westward goal of your coast-to-coast -coast voyage. Here, the broad Pacific pearls and pulses on the sunny frontier of America. Thank you, Lorena. You can go to the next. Oh, cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here to present to you a project of mine titled Monumental Interventions, which you just saw an excerpt of. Um, it's, a, it's a much longer piece. Um, and so Monumental Interventions is a video installation which brings monuments and architecture to life to explore critical perspectives on militarism in the San Diego region. Um, if folks aren't familiar with San Diego, uh, it's the most southwestern most city in the United States, bordering Mexico, and um, is a tourist destination known worldwide uh, for, you know, its amazing beaches, amazing weather, uh, but lesser known are um, its impacts abroad and also the social impacts upon San Diego itself, which is the most militarized metropolitan region in the country. And so when I first began this project, uh, the idea it began in 2017. The idea was to imbue uh, the, the built environment with perspectives on militarism and imperialism uh, that we don't normally see, that we don't normally hear in our built environment. 
And uh, so that idea, uh, to some extent, evolved into um, this idea of like an afterlife for monuments, you know, um, at a time uh, beginning in 2017, when I started it, you know, there's a lot of uh, protests around colonial monuments on the East Coast. And so thinking about that, um, what what happens to, you know, a certain memorial um, when it is removed, where does that history go? It's just like an ongoing question. And so I see these, um, these monuments as sort of speaking posthumously um, in sort of an afterlife. Um, and so Lorena, you can go to the next. So the process for making these this this artwork um, is a result of testimonies uh, conducted with a number of community members, uh, activists, historians, uh, which were motion tracks. Which means you know every interview I conducted, the interviewee was required to wear these facial motion tracking dots as well as a head mounted camera, which captures their facial gestures and the motion from their face, which is used to, to bring the, the environment to life. And so if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, after developing this piece for ongoing for about four years, maybe probably more actually, um, it proved to be challenging to get into exhibitions to get it to be seen, um, which you could imagine. Um, but over the course of that four years, I, I learned by uh, writing grant proposals uh, with project descriptions that simply stated that the project was just simply about the military, you know, um, alone on a local level was much easier to, to gather support in that with that as a strategy. Um, not necessarily giving too much away about sort of the, the perspectives that, that were part of the piece. Um, and so in 2023, February of this year, uh, it was exhibited at the San Diego International Airport. Uh, and, but unfortunately, following uh, some comments that were made or possibly just one comment that was made uh, regarding its uh, wokeness, quote unquote, um, the piece was removed uh, soon after installation. And so um, that is essentially the lifetime of that particular piece. And, um, you know, and this is why I'm extremely grateful for this, this artwork to be, or these materials from this artwork and portions of it to be housed in an archive um, at the U of A. And so, so th thank you, I appreciate that. That's everything. Thank you so much, Evan, for sharing that powerful work with us. Uh, and we are also very excited that it's going to be available for the long, long term in, in the archive. So next we have Gabriela Trevino, who is going to share about the work of the Rio Grande International Study Center. We remember our songs, we remember our language, we remember our sacred places, we remember where we're, our, our grandfathers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers, where they're buried. I remember all of that. And that's why we, we carry on the traditions that we do, because we remember. And uh, I know it's a new time and everybody's looking at their, their so-called indigenous roots. But it's a time also to understand that there were there were tribal nations that were all along this this river, and um, and those tribal nations were mostly Carrizo Pumetudos, and so from Boca Chica all the way up to to the Rocky Mountains where the waters come from, the headwaters. So I want to remember all the water when it used to be clean. I want to remember when the air used to be clean. I want to remember when the land used to be clean. And then I also want to remember why it's not like that anymore. And I remember working in those fields with those, those uh, airplanes flying over us and um, spraying pesticide on, on top of us. I remember those things. And those things are important for us to always remember that we're part of it. Because as you can see, they're building things that we don't need because they cause divisions. 
We have relatives on both sides of this river, so they're dividing families. And they've been doing that for years, so I want to remember that. I want to remember that we're, we're, we're part of the age that's going to the stars, and you're coming right behind us, and that we don't longer see the oppression. I want to remember that. I want to make sure that you get a good education. Hi everyone, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Gabriela Trevino and I am a programming coordinator for the Rio Grande International Study Center in Laredo, Texas. Uh, RISC, as I will be referring to it, um, the acronym for the study center. Uh, RISC is a 501c3 nonprofit founded in January of 1994. The organization's mission is to preserve and protect the Rio Grande, also known as the Rio Bravo, its watershed and its environment. The approach, um, the approach that the organization takes is um, holistic. Our aim is awareness, advocacy, research, education, stewardship, and binational collaboration for the benefit of present and future generations. Uh, so for two years, we worked on a project entitled Achieving Climate, Environmental and Racial Justice in Laredo con Arte y Cultura. Um, and a, a great example of the work that we did is what you just saw in the video. It, it's an example of the type of programming we were doing in the city um, through this project. Uh, the event in the video was an event that we did to unveil a massive 238-foot um, by 10-foot mural called uh, Mi Rio Grande, done by a local artist uh, named Antonio Choni Briones. He was commissioned to do the work um, by risk at an inner city park where um, everybody could enjoy and learn from. Um, just to highlight the work of Tony, he endured freezing and scorching temperatures to paint uh, the sweeping panorama of the Rio Grande's ecosystem. Uh, the mural also features local flora, local fauna, and its centerpiece is um, based on the person you saw speaking in the video, Juan Mancia. Uh, Juan Mancias is doing a Native American tribal uh, ceremonial dance um, with the, his tribe is called Carizo Come Crudo. Uh, and Tony, the, the muralist, is also a member of, of the tribe. Uh, educational and interactive stations for, for kids were where they could learn about art and uh, local wildlife were set up also at the event and uh, the members of the community were invi invited to celebrate and speak to Tony about his process, about being an artist. And the Carizo Come Crudo tribe was there and um, they were able to do performance. They, they sang traditional songs in their pr traditional language. And uh, they also got the kids to interact with them. They showed them a, a dance um, that they do and also taught them some uh, some words. Um, and so this was um, this involving the Carizo Come Crudo tribe uh, is something that we we wanted to do as we as we work through this project um, because the Carizo Come Crudo tribe is one of the original tribes from from the region. They they were here before the, the Spanish came um, and made their settlement. Um, and this is a history that isn't taught in, in local schools. Um, 
So involving them, we had the goal of getting getting the community to know one that they exist, that they have existed and will continue to, and also learn what they stand for. In the mural, Tony um, painted the uh, prophecies um, that the that the tribe teaches. Um, and we also very much connected with um, what they stand for. They stand for taking care of the land in which we live. Um, and this is just one example of the types of programming that, that we were able to do through this, through this, um, through this project. Uh, we've done other events of this kind involving artists, the public, and all in nature. Uh, in, in addition to our cultural and arts related events, we have done research and advocacy work for the creation of a binational river park. This idea was born in meetings with uh, U.S. Ambassador in Mexico, Ken, Ken Salazar. Um, and our input is being considered for this project that will be a, a long term project. Uh, this park would serve as a conversation conservation project to protect the river from any possible interventions that may Im impact or endanger it. It would be 6.2 miles long. It would protect the surrounding ecosystem, uh, which acts as a haven for migratory species such as birds and butterflies. And in, in addition to this preservation goal, the park would also serve as a community meeting space, as all parks are intended to, to be used for exercise, recreation, enjoying the outdoors. So on a personal level, I'm very excited for this project to come to fruition. Um, as a child growing up in this community, the river always seemed off limits, um, like a site of danger or disgust. So projects like this one would give the river back to the people. And I believe that having a sense of ownership over something will encourage the act of taking care of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for sharing with us about the important work y'all are doing over at risk. And next we have Janae Sanchez, who's going to be talking about the Border Arts Corridor. Thank you, Anita. Uh, and um, we owned a coffee shop and, and began working with artists and, and exhibiting artists. And we learned uh, the dynamic like cultural production that was already being done. So um, fast forward to 2018, we established a nonprofit. And you know, we really learned that there is a, a, a voice in the region. And we were really excited to find ways to amplify. So through writing grants, uh, we were uh, recipients of the Ford Border or Ford Nalak Border Narrative Change Grant. And with this project, we supported six emerging artists in both Douglas, three in Douglas, three in Agua Prieta, whose life, art, histories were woven between the US-Mexico border. So this was a nine-month period where fellows were immersed in a process of exploration. And you know, we really we're involved in as an organization with the with the artists to think about and and imagine like how we would exist in the future um, in the future borderlands. So here's a, a an image of the six artists that we supported: Gio Maybe, Dara Preciado, Alan Rubio, Ami Robles, Nidia Avila, and Stephanie Zamaripa. Next slide, please. Uh, so our fellows were were selected based on a nomination process. And um, we, we gathered a panel and they really set out to focus on contents and, and knowledge that they were eager to learn about. So the first phase of the project was all about research. Here are a few images of um, product and also process. This is a, an image of Geo Maybe's final final project and his focus was fashion design and he was really interested in migration and um, then the next slide to the right is Dara Preciado's, Preciado's paintings um, and she was interested in local oral histories and then the small bottom image is a, a workshop that was conducted by Stephanie and she was uh, interested in learning about local history and contemporary life and sort of merging those two into large format paintings. Next slide, please. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the fellowship is rooted in, in learning and skill sharing. And here are the, the main components of the fellowship. There was a mentorship uh, component where we brought in mentors. Um, you know, this was all 2021. So all, most of these activities were done virtually um, and some artists did conduct um, in-person activities. Uh, so community learning where, you know, the artists chose a topic they wanted to learn about and we activated our, our community and brought in experts from the field. So, you know, uh, local historians, um, teachers, and, and also folks that had knowledge from, from the community. And then artists also shared skills. So, you know, this is an image of Nidia conducting a free dance workshop. Uh, Alan Rubio also conducted dance workshops. Ami Robles conducted uh, photography workshops and so on. And then finally, the last phase of the of the fellowship was to make a piece of art or or begin an, an art making um, process. And um, so all of this was funded throughout. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a, an example of a flyer that was put out on social media that invited the community to join in a, in a conversation rooted in Douglas and Aguaprieta history. And here's an image of three local historians. Um, and all of this was, it was virtual and also streamed on our Facebook. And I have a small clip of uh, Jeannie Jordan, you know, enthusiastically talking about um, some of her stories. Be we here in this region. So when he made the decision and it, it started to boom here, people started coming. There were a lot of Europeans in Mexico, like Beth was talking about. Everybody's looking for an opportunity. People are coming from Europe. They're all over the place in Mexico. And then all of a sudden, they hear opportunity is going to be here in Douglas and in Agua Prieta. By the way, a little side thing. Somebody from from Scotland came in and he asked me for the translation of Agua Prieta. I mean, oh, Agua Prieta, be the, you know, the know-it-all, Agua, water, Prieta, dark. And he says, okay, what does Douglas mean? So I get really smarty pants and I go, oh, Douglas means, and I started giving him a history lesson. He said, no, I asked you for a translation. He goes, it's a Scottish word. I have no clue what he's talking about. And then he asked me again, what does our Prieta translate to? And in Scotland and in Spanish, the translation means the same, dark water. It's magic. I think it's magic. I love the idea that we, we have the same meaning in our name. But I didn't believe him. So as soon as he left, I get on the internet and I start typing in, what does doubles mean in Scottish? Sure enough, he was correct. So there's a lot of things that are very special about our border. So that's a, just an example of um, a community learning session. And I would say about three, three of our fellows really gravitated to local history and their projects uh, really focused on individual, these threads of history, but also um, contemporary life. Uh, so here's an example of kind of a process. This is Ami Robles, and she's a multimedia artist, mostly focusing on photography, installation, video. Um, so we have like her workshop flyer. Um, there's a screenshot of her conducting her workshop online. And then her final project was an installation called My Safe Space, which was a tent, lots of things that created comfort for her and also um, a, a slideshow of images and sounds from, from Agua Prieta uh, that made her feel safe. Look, next slide, please. Uh, another slideshow, this is Gio Mavi. Uh, his learning session focused on understanding trauma within the borderlands. So we brought in Bianca from Aliento and Mark Adams from Frontera de Cristo to to really give us an update on what was happening, especially um, with um, the asylum situation. And he conducted a fashion design workshop for the community. Next slide, please. 
Uh, here's an image of our mentors. Uh, this is Carolina Aranibar Fernandez and also Alejandro Macias. And again, they were a part of the entire process. I believe they met with the fellows for about 15 times in a ninth month in a ninth month period and also attended the art the art walk in Douglas and Agua Prieta. Next slide, please. Okay, and then I'll leave you with a short video. And um, this was produced by Luisa Santos Martinez, who is our programs assistant and, and now our artistic director. Um, and it just gives some highlights of, of the of the art walk, which was the our community celebration event. Thank you. Thank you, Janae, for sharing with us about the Border Arts Corridor. And we are now going to have our final presentation. Our final panelist is Alejandra Aragón, who's going to share with us about her artistic practice. Chavalos is a collaboration. Okay, Shabalix is a collaborative project that focuses on creating uh, spaces of reflection through photography in rural areas of Northern Mexico that have been usually stigmatized by violence. The intention is to integrate the community into the creative process. Um, it all started when I was doing a previous project called Vinia La Pinta, which uh, focused on the absence of father figures and his relationship to migration and masculinities. So when I was working on that project, I met my cousin and his friends, and I realized that um, they were feeling very attracted towards uh, the life of drug trafficking. Um, my cousin ended up uh, moving to the US uh, to work like every kid that doesn't have much opportunities. And at the beginning, so that's when I decided to use the, the grant to produce this project. At the beginning, I wanted to focus on two stories, that of Marcia and Fabian, who is a singer from the United States and who uh, travels usually to Mexico in search of the nostalgia for his family, his origins, and his father, who was murdered in 2010. But I just realized that these two particular uh, kids were just moving around a lot and they didn't want to and they were particularly interested in learning photography, so I didn't want to force that dynamic. Once I got the resources, I started uh, explorations of these places by going spending time with the community. 
uh, I wanted to find more reciprocal reciprocal strategies to question above all extractivist uh, ways of photography. So my first uh, act, my first action was to exchange polar dyes with kids who I knew could not uh, take the workshops that I wanted to implement. Uh, but above all, because most most people that are photographed through documentary style uh, photography rarely see their images. Uh, and rarely see um, where they are displayed. Uh, so that was the intention also to exchange images with the kids in this rural area. The first workshop was held in Gomez Faria in Gomez Farias, Chihuahua, which is pointed in the map, and then in the border of uh, Juarez Valley in Guadalupe and San Agustin. In Gomez Farias, um, it was a great experience. I was lucky that the uh, high school I approached was a fund of photography. So he was a great support and he let me borrow his cameras along with other cameras that I borrowed to, to give the, the workshop. Um, the kids show me the ways, the their town in different ways. And when it came to having these conversations about the reality of their towns, very interesting ways of representing issues such as violence or roles, like this example of Angelica who manages to represent violence in a very powerful and sensitive uh, way, affirming life from her innocence. We had a local exhibition after each workshop and to share with community and the families. And I did went and reproduced the same, um, this, uh, the sort of same uh, activities in the other towns. Uh, these are the exercises by the kids in Guadalupe, uh, self portraits that were very sensitive and reflective on the territory, or this by Azul, which was uh, more intimate and focused on her body. In addition to self-representation, the strategy was to carry out exercises documenting daily life, home, friends, family, economic activities, and landscape. The young people were re very receptive and they learned technique, technical issues very quickly. They really wanted to express themselves like this exercise by Yvonne, who decided that fire would represent her personality and her relationship to her emotions. Or like Haciel, who through his shyness and his walks uh, showed, um, demonstrated a great sensitivity to get uh, closer to people through photography. Or like Yvette, who achieved these very intimate portraits of her family and the difficult losses they have suffered, like the death of her two brothers. And this was our final exhibition in the Guadalupe town. Here we received a lot of support from the community and the public administration. For example, these partitions were made with materials donated by the students of San Agustin and designed by Alejandro, a very enthusiastic young man. San Agustin is another town from uh, the Valley of Juarez. I worked at the Museum of, of San Agustin, which is a kind of cultural oasis for the Valley of Juarez, where people of all ages and uh, with a history of great resistance also. In our reflections of this workshop, we um, talked about important issues such as the rights of young people. We were able to connect the class to cultural and political activities of the museum, such as the commemoration of the 24th anniversary of the fight against the Sierra Blanca nuclear dump, in which the communities of the Valley and those of the US were a uh, part of. Um, then we had our final exhibition at the museum. And um, the last activity in the community was to paste our images in the walls of different towns that make up the Valley of Juarez next to the highway and thus share the work with more people in the community. Um, and like the, the, an example of the spaces we intervened was this dispatcher who dispatchers uh, abandoned house uh, because he was murdered uh, while working during the war against trafficking. Uh, occupying the public space was for us another way of resisting and sending a symbolic message. Finally, we had our closing exhibition in Ciudad Juarez where we brought 
the entire community to share with a different audience. The curatorship was held by Leon de la Rosa, an artist who lives in San Agustin as well. And thinking already in the archival process, we decided to incorporate archival materials within the exhibition. We had guided tours with the with the Chavalex. We talked about, they talked about their images and their experiences during the workshop. Leon wrote a beautiful curatorial um, text and I made experimental piece integrating the self-representations of young people in other rural areas of the country using social media. Chago, an artist from Caseta, another town in Valley of Juarez, came and painted our, our title. We included a lot of materials and uh, like the documentation of our pay stubs and most kids were able to attend and we had a lot of fun celebrating our work. Um, this way, um, during the two months of the exhibition, we had we held two forums, one on collaborative processes, where we brought Adolfo and uh, Juan Gonzalez, who made a documentary on the Raramuri experience of Adolfo who belongs to this group and both made the documentary Acá with a perspective from the most remote communities of La Sierra. We donated three cameras to the community, one to the Okuhab, a space recently created by Alejandro, a young man who took the workshop in San Agustin and motivated by the experience of Chavalos, made this great achievement of making their new, their, um, uh, a new space for young kids at the Valley. I am very grateful to NALAC, the, the Ford Foundation and the Conference Center for your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Gracias a todos. Those were such incredible presentations. I'm sure that if we were in person, you would be hearing lots of really enthusiastic and excited applause, but I will speak for, I'm sure, the many, many participants who are here and saying thank you so much for sharing all of the incredible work that you're doing, which intersects in so many different exciting ways. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all in conversation about what you all are doing. So the name of the initiative from Ford was Reclaiming the Border Narrative, which implies that there is a border narrative. We know that there are many border narratives out there, which is why all of your work speaks so beautifully too. But to start out, I'm wondering if you all could say a little bit about which aspects of the more destructive dominant border narratives your practice and work is really trying to change or to undermine. And we can start with anyone. Sorry, I know it's so awkward in a Zoom room. It's so much easier in person. Those like little tiny head nods, you can know who's who's going to jump in. But it's okay if we all jump all over each other. People will know we're excited to talk. I think I can start. Um, I am from the Mexican side of the border. I, I don't know if I'm the only one from the Mexican side. I think there's another organization in the program. But you know how difficult is the narrative about violence in this side of the border, which is very real. You know how it was explained at the beginning, um, the conditions of the border as the political space have created a lot of violence in, as in a strategic space. But uh, I think what we have discovered in a city like Juarez is that community focused work is so important because that's the only sort of tool we have against the very real violence and the very real struggles of the of the community. So whatever work that focuses on creating community spaces and is making the community more strong or stronger, I think that is uh, the focus of most artists in Juarez because we know that it does have an effect. And our problems also have to do with the lack of resources, you know? So having a project like this one funded, I, I mean, I could not have done it without the border grant because I live in Juarez and there, there's, it's very difficult to reach rural areas in the border, even though they're relatively close. So um, 
I think that from the beginning, focuses, focusing on community was very important as an artist, even though I am an artist, a visual multidisciplinary artist. Go ahead, Jenny. I would like to add, you know, when you grow up, I also grew up in, in Douglas and also lived a period of time in Agua Prieta. And when you're immersed in the everyday, the mundane, you know, you're, you live within these spaces where culture and language merge and it just seems normal and beautiful and loving and safe. And then unfortunately, once you have access to highly political um, rhetoric, uh, you know, it's, there's a, a way that it hurts you, it stings. And so as far as changing the narrative, I think we're trying to complicate the, the oversimplified narratives and while acknowledging tribulations, uh, but we're amplifying like stories of love and home and how we can imagine a future where the narrative is actually dominated by fronterizos, fronterizo creative scholars, cultural workers. Um, so that's that's sort of like the impetus of our work, what we're hoping to do. Thank you. I could speak a little bit about the Florence Project's point of view on this. Um, one of the narratives that we want to counter is that there's like a quote unquote crisis of people arriving to seek refuge at the border. Um, you know, this seems to be based on like a, a scarcity mindset that we, we want to counter. I mean, there, first of all, there's many reasons why immigration is, is good for the country and we should, but we shouldn't have to explain that because this isn't about the economy or culture. It's, it's a conversation about human life. And um, as to the concerns that you know, there isn't enough infrastructure to process the people that are seeking to enter the U.S. I mean, not only are there many humanitarian organizations and legal services, nonprofits like the Florence Project, which are already stepping up to address the issue, um, there are, you know, resources that Customs and Border Protection have that are instead being used to detain people and to further militarize the border. Um, those would be better allocated to, to welcoming people. And you know, while there are huge lines and people are forced to, to camp at the border, um, that's because we've closed off the traditional pathways to protection. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is a crisis that we've created. And the way, um, you know, we put it is that there's a crisis of compassion in the government uh, failing to live up to its own duty to welcome people who are in danger. Yeah, I think. Um for risk in, in Laredo, um, we have a similar goal. Um, there has been this narrative, you know, the president declared a national emergency at the border and we're, um, so one of the direct ways that that, that was confronted, um, the members of the, of the org went out on kayaks um, on the river with a big banner that said, where's the emergency? <laughs> because it's just like what you see on the news versus what you see in your day to day, just to let everyone know, you know, your, your version of reality um, is, is what we've been trying to do. And yes, definitely the, the narrative that, you know, the border is a dangerous place is one that, that we've been actively trying to combat. You want to also add something, Evan? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it's com it's complex for me. I think that the narratives, like how my work changes a narrative, is um, about shifting shifting the the direction of of the lens, so to speak. You know, um, the work here what the work is about here is it, it's in it's in San Diego it's focused on this region um and it's looking at you know not only the militarization of the border itself but the whole the various branches of, of the military and how they're interconnected and um you know looking at sort of the the ethics around militarism itself you know um and so, you know, we, we focus often on the violence, perhaps like south of the border or, you know, um, sort of the, the fear that is um, 
that is conveyed, you know, in, in mass media, um, we don't necessarily look at, okay, well, what what are what is what is the US doing? What are what are the branches of the military doing? And how can we focus on them to create more of a just and more round, well-rounded actual view of, of the reality of the entire situation, you know? Um, so I would say that's that's how that's my perspective. And also, um, you know, like there there's a long history of of um organizing political organizing around militarism you know the u.s itself has a has a very rich history of an anti-war history and um and obviously also along the border there's a very rich history of of organizing political organizing you know in san diego and all over and so um i think i see it as a very interesting overlap to, to find overlaps in that because you know san diego exists as a region as a militarized region to um, as a place of strategy to leverage to act to access Latin America and to access the Pacific and so not just the border the border itself is not the only border literally the ocean is is a border you know and so um, the entire United States the the perimeter is the border you know and so there are various narratives that overlap there. So we know that shifting and changing that's difficult work that's the work that you all are doing in the day to day and it provokes strong reactions as some of your presentations have already alluded to so wondering if you could say a little bit about the receptions to your work the sort of spectrum of receptions positive and negative and also some of the major challenges that you faced logistical challenges challenges in terms of policy um, financial challenges I think I mentioned the challenges in the first uh, question, but adding a little bit to what Evan mentioned, um, I am not so much in the opinion that just like happy washing the border narrative will be enough to actually um, sort of um, it, para incidir en la realidad de la frontera. Um, I think we need to, um, for example, with my project, I wanted to also show that we are not a passive community. We're not just here uh, receiving passively the decisions of the two countries that are fighting against each other within our territory. You know, that this crack that happens when the interest of both countries sort of materialize in our territory. Uh, we're not passive and we are trying to um, affirm life and our way of living as a, as, a, as a complex hybrid of cultures and economic disparities, because that's a reality that the border, I don't see it as, a, as, as this sort of utopian uh, mixture of culture, but rather a very, um, sorry, my, I live, I'm in Mexico City, so people are screaming outside in the street. <laughs> um, so I just always want to say that the Mexican side of the border operates as another barrier to the US side of the border. And in the same way, we are sort of sacrificed first in that dynamic uh, uh, throughout political interest. But we are a community that is fighting to affirm uh, who we are and what we want. And we also use these projects to, to demand uh, the and what we need as a community to overcome because it's sort of complex. We receive support to make our community stronger from uh, sources that are also um, financing the war against drugs. So it's so weird to be receiving 
uh, resources, and I'm not talking about this particular one, I'm talking, for example, the Plan Merida, which was done a few years ago, uh, which brought a lot of support economically, that's because that's mostly what we need, but also was financing the war itself. So it was so conflicting that the interest of the US regarding the, the Mexican side of the border are always sort of uh, two direction, uh, so yeah, and the struggles are those, to be able to finance our projects, to be able to uh, make ourselves understood against a barrier of a lot of prejudice against uh, Mexico, but also that I cannot deny that the struggles are real, so I can show you a happy uh, side of the border. I mean, we are strong, we live lives in a very energetic way, but we demand peace because there's no peace totally. I'll speak to this in, in a really local way. Um, we received very positive feedback. I think our community was really proud that we received this substantial grant that really transformed our organization where we were able to hire two staff members for the first time in our organizational history. And we really invested in artists um, for the first time in this way. Um, and just the gratitude to Nalak and Ford for making it possible and the Confluence Center for carrying this work into the future. Um, it was a really intergenerational experience. And, you know, as we were amplifying and celebrating lived experience, um, for some people, it was the first time that that labor was remunerated. So investing dollars was appreciated, but sometimes confusing. Um, you know, say we, our fellows received $4,000 as a stipend, and then they had a budget of about 1800 for supplies and then a budget for their work, you know, so there was always funding going towards supplies and, and, and um, panelists got paid as well. And I think that was confusing and maybe troubling for some community members where, you know, this this labor is often done unpaid. And so, we, you know, setting a precedent for, for paying people um, is something we're really proud to have set, but, and I think the work of convincing community that this is how we should do this type of work is, is a labor of love uh, and something we'll continue to do. And I still feel we can raise our stipend amount and, you know, um, but we we made all of that information really public. Um, so that was just, you know, kind of a local experience that was positive and had its like layer of negativity, which um, we learned from. Thank you both for sharing that. And you've all gestured towards the blending of past, present and future in your work. and. I think that is so much at the heart of archives, as Veronica said at the very beginning of this forum, that archives really do sit at that nexus of preserving something, but there's no point in preserving it without thinking about a future. There's something inherently hopeful about preserving and documenting and recording. So with that in mind, what did you first think when you were approached about contributing to a digital archive and what really are your hopes for what will happen with the materials that you have contributed to this? I'll uh, speak on behalf of the Florence Project. I, you know, we were really excited. Um, you know, archives are traditionally, it seems like an elite space that are used to document famous individuals' lives or historic events and um, so we're excited that you know, there's an effort to include historically oppressed groups such as migrants. Um, and yeah, one of our goals in our work is to document injustice, pursue accountability, raise public awareness, and the University of Arizona and the Ford Foundation archiving our testimonials and our client stories, you know, we hope will 
will will further the cause and and inspire people to pursue more humane systems of immigration. If if not now, then then in the future. And um, we're really grateful for this to extend that impact. I'll I'll speak if I if I can muster something together. Um, yeah, I. Like I said earlier, I think it was a, a really crucial moment to, to be convening with the Compton Center, um, particularly because of the situation um, of an attempt to exhibit this, this project and you know having, having it be removed due to its political nature. And, um, and so one, it's, it's challenging for artists to, to get our work seen sometimes. It's challenging for it to not only live on your um, on your high drive at home, you know, um, which is currently the state, right? So to have it be recognized and appreciated for its challenging, you know, for its challenges and risks, risks, and um, you know, it's just an honor to to have to have it be housed and for have to have it be cared for in some way, other than just myself, right? So. Um, on behalf of RISC, um, we were very excited to get the opportunity to, to preserve the work that has been done um, and have it available for use by future generations. Um, I think that's, that's the most exciting part. Um, and it kind of uh, changes the way we, we view about this community work that, that is being done it's like, how come we don't document everything else? <laughs> um, because, you know, so many hands, uh, so many brains go into, into the work that we do. And for it to be documented in this way, um, you know, step by step, uh, person by person, um, and have that, rec have that recognition of, of everybody who is involved, I think, uh, is long overdue um and I, I, my you know i like to think in hypotheticals but i hope that you know the kids who have contributed to these projects are able to, to you know look up pictures of themselves doing this work like 10 15 years from now and think like oh yeah i, I helped build this um Well, thank you all so much for sharing the work that you're doing and then for sharing more in conversation with each other. This was a really inspiring conversation. I know that I took a lot out of it. I'm sure that all of the participants here also did. I'm going to turn it over now for a closing, but we will have a little bit of time after the official close of this for Q&A from the audience. So if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of this window to submit your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wizard Hernandez for moderating our first Frontier Forum event. Um, thank you, Daniel, Evan, Gabriela, Jenny, and Alejandra for sharing your reflections and approaches to reclaiming the world narrative and honoring the realities, stories, and expressions of borderlands communities and migrants. Um, thank you to Ron and Mercedes, our interpreters for this event and a special thank you to the four foundation and the reclaiming the border narrative partner organizations for supporting and driving this work including the national association of latino arts and culture the national association of hispanic journalists Orealist philanthropy the center for cultural power and the southwest folk life alliance we hope you will be able to stick around for the Q&A, but if not, we would like to ask the audience to take our post-event survey before leaving. Um, we're dropping the link in the chat right now. Your feedback will help us shape future events. We will also like to invite you to sign up for the Confluence Center newsletter, dropping the link as well, to receive information about the digital archive, the project website, and future events. You can also follow the Confluence Center and the libraries on social media. We will now transition into the Q&A section of the program, moderated by Dr. Anita Wizard-Hernandez. 
So we are, we all have the opportunity to be in this giant virtual room together. So if you would like to ask your question and be in direct dialogue with the panelists, we invite you to do that. Uh, you can ask your questions anonymously and then I'm happy to read them, but you can also ask them, uh, I think with your name or you could feel free to drop that in the chat and we will do our best to make sure that we're monitoring all of the different places that people can be asking questions. Uh, but to start out, there was a question about how these materials are gonna be made accessible to the public. So I don't know if someone maybe from the project team wanted to say a little bit about the plans for the archive itself and where it will be housed and how it will be accessible. Hi. Yeah, this is Bianca Finley Alper. I'm the digital project archivist. And we are building, we are co creating a digital archive that will be publicly accessible online. This digital archive um, will have material that is um, cur curated by all the participants, many of whom you met today, and will be available through many points of entry. We have a public facing project website that will launch shortly. And that will be a way for everybody to find out more about <clears throat> the participants and their work. Great, thank you so much, Bianca, for that information. So it's I know that there's been a lot of information that's been put in the chat, but certainly you can follow Confluence and the UA libraries to make sure that you have that website address when it does launch. I'm sure there will be lots of uh, fanfare when it gets out, much deserved fanfare when it's there. Uh, and then uh, another question that was in the chat is, in terms of the archive, what steps um, are folks taking to make sure that sensitive materials, materials relating to indigenous history, there's other kinds of sensitive materials that are being discussed are properly taken care of? So I don't know if any of the panelists maybe wanted to talk about how you deal with sensitive information, you're dealing with, you know, children, with people who have um, different kinds of status. And so how do you, what are the ethics of that for you all as practitioners and as advocates? And then we can also have someone from the libraries talk about how the archive is dealing with that. I was thinking specifically maybe Gabriela, Gabriela about, you know, y'all working with youth and Alejandra also, or Daniel and the Florence Project, working with people who's who have different kinds of status and, you know, how you all navigate that. Maybe I can answer your question, Anita. I don't know where that was uh, written. I couldn't read it, but I can answer it along with another question that I see in the chat, which is how I foster collaboration and trust with the participants. And I think it's a whole process uh, where you have to consider up until the end of the process to assure the, the trust of the participants throughout. You know, now that I need to archive the project, I need to present um, the authorizations of uh, the minors uh, to incorporate, even though I am managing my archive independently. Um, but I had that from the beginning. And the reason why I wanted to convey a trustworthy process was because um, this is a collaborative project. They, we all have the right to use uh, the images we produce during the workshops. Uh, but also the only way to acquire such trust is to spend time in the community, to be connected with it in a more intimate level and to reach out to a further uh, work network of people. In my project, we, I connected with a network of supporters in each town that uh, worked with the project throughout the process. And that is why it became a, 
a collaborative big project, not only of myself, but the curator, the participants of the workshops, the Museum of San, of San Agustin, and also have been in certain in, in a community where the trust you makes the kid trust you. And also I decided to have a, a particular approach on the teaching method, which we will be publishing in a different publication in, in the future. We are looking for resources to do that where me along Leon de la Rosa, which was the who was the curator for my for the exhibition, want to share the methodologies of how to approach uh, community. For example, I decided to approach high schools uh, as a way to have uh, a safe space to work in because um, there were not a lot of community spaces um, where we receive support with. Uh, uh, materials and, um, and equipment and even transportation because there's no public transportation in these towns. And also I uh, I made a link, how do you call it? Hice un vínculo con Azul Arena, which is a project working in Ciudad Juarez, uh, interested in exhibiting the work of artists from the region. And Azul Arena came and supported the exhibition in the last part of the process. And throughout this process, the kids were made part of. We have a WhatsApp group. We uh, talked about how to use the cameras and how to approach life in the Valle de Juarez and La Sierra. But also we goof around and we speak. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, I think I'm up to date with the internet things, you know, so that helps a lot knowing what the emojis mean and how to use stickers, that's great help. I mean, um, I'm not that young anymore, but I, I can connect with the kids and I think they connected with me. So hopefully in the future, and if the conference center is interested, we can have a, uh, manage to reach to, uh, we can manage to provide you with this book that we're going to be producing in the probably next year. Uh, so, and we want to make it Creative Commons so people can access it uh, freely on a PDF. Uh, but yeah, hopefully there, that requires a whole nother process for me. Uh, but it just, it's just a, a certain methodology but I'm also a very organic and very trying to live life, me, me, me as well as an artist, because it's not just going, I'm gonna make this project, you know, I'm working here. It's like I'm experiencing life also with the kids and with the community. And I love the community. I like being there. I like going to Los Bailes y a, a Los Arenales and todo eso. So I, I enjoy the life in the community as well. So. Maybe that's a little bit of your question, Richard. I, I, I hope I answered the question. Sorry, I'm not very brief. No, that's great. Thank you for elaborating on that. I don't know if anyone else wanted to say a little bit about uh, this, how you deal with sensitive materials or maybe to broaden the question, also censored materials and how you deal with sensitivity and censorship in your work? I can speak to it. Um, so one, in terms of like sensitive material, uh, when I first started approaching people to, to interview for my piece, um, I, you know, with individuals who perhaps had um, information that they were worried that, you know, they didn't want to show their face or they simply worried about being in front of camera. Um, I actually offered, you know, I made it clear that, you know, it's act, not actually their their face and, you know, I could alter their voice that in a way that would actually conceal their, their identity um, within the piece. Um, and I, you know, there was, there was one individual who wasn't featured in the excerpt that I showed who, you know, remain, remained anonymous uh, even in like the finished piece. And so 
just the animation itself, which they, you know, performed was, is what people saw. So in terms of sensitive material, it's kind of, it's almost like a method you'd see in a, in a true crime show or something where someone's face is blurred or, or to, to that extent, you know? Um, so that was kind of an approach that I started using. Um, as far as, uh, you know, traversing censored material or the, the, the idea of censorship, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a fun, fun experience. Uh, mostly it's, you know, in making the, the piece, I knew, um, it was potentially, it was going to be risky, you know? Um, at the end of the day, you you just decide you do you make an artwork that is mysterious, you know, perhaps not as direct. And and what is your what is your soul telling you to do? What do you what feels what feels more honest, or what do you feel should come out, you know? And so um, that piece is particularly like direct, and um, and that was just something that I decided to do very early on. Um, However, uh, you know, I I see like the the imagery itself. It, it's it's a very surreal series of scenes. You know, it's a it's kind of a fantasy in some way. Um, there are talking statues. It's not something that happens in real life, right? So, in a way, I saw that as kind of like a a camouflage that that draws people in. So, you know, um, when I'm proposing something. I'll show a segment that is visually compelling and um, that that has a, a tendency to draw people in enough to gain interest. And once they're that behind over that barrier, then the information can be conveyed a little bit easier, if that makes sense. I had some similar experiences. Go for it. Um, at the Forms Project, we've had similar experiences to Alejandra and to Evan. Um, I think that, you know, like back to like what Alejandra was saying about building trust, like it's, it's, it's important, of course, for them to feel comfortable working with you and for that dynamic to create good art, but also it's important so that they feel comfortable saying no if they don't want to, right? Because you don't want anyone to feel um, coerced or anything. So it, we work with our like the person who's closest to the person, be it their attorney or legal assistant or social worker who who is, is best able to articulate, like, are you sure you want to do this? Is this really something you, you want to do or is, you don't you don't feel obliged, do you? So we just want to make sh very clear that um, everyone we work with in this sort of storytelling is really into it, like wants to do it. And once we get there, similar to like what Evan was saying, you have you have stories where individuals are like, I really want to tell my story but I, I can't, you can't use my name or face. And, you know, it can be hard to do good storytelling without a, a picture, right? So um, that's why working with artists was so helpful because we were able to approach an, uh, an artist and say, hey, we're not gonna show you a, a photo of this person. So you can't know what they look like, but we want you to create art about like a, a, like a 17 year old-ish kid from Mexico doing this or that. and we were able to recreate our clients' lived experiences in really vivid and beautiful and striking ways without compromising anonymity. Um, and also, you know, show sometimes places where, you know, you can't go like uh, detention centers, border patrol cells, you know, through illustration or aerial footage photography was also useful in taking people there and letting them see what it's like. I think Veronica was also going to share a little bit about how the archives deal with sensitive information from that perspective as well. Unless she's having internet issues. In which case I'm sure Megan could also talk about how the archives deal with sensitive issues. I would like to defer to Bianca and Alba. Oh, Veronica can't unmute. Okay, Michelle, can sorry. you uh, unmute her? Uh, I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. I, 
I'm having all kinds of technical issues over here. Can you all hear me? No? Oh, yes. Gosh. Yes, we can hear you. You can? You can hear me? Yes. This is Bianca. I can hear you. Thank you. I think I heard you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll pass it on to Bianca in a bit. Um, I just wanted to share that our approach for uh, the digital archive um, is somewhat experimental. You know, we handle um, these kinds of materials on a pretty regular basis, but not all at once. Um, one of the things that we um, are working with is a system called Domain of One's Own through uh, a product that is uh, allows for individuals to use the platforms. Um, to provide access to the materials. One of those platforms is a platform called Mukurtu, for instance, because uh, the question is about indigenous materials specifically. That allows for, and I'm just kind of pausing here because everybody's frozen and I'm not. So I just want to check in that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, and so that particular uh, platform allows for restrictions. Uh, so as the grantees are, you know, as all of the, uh, the folks working on these projects are uh, recognizing or acknowledging that there needs to be some restrictions along with their community partners, they can choose that, that platform in order to restrict. I think we just lost um, Veronica to the storms again. Um, I will share a little bit more about Mukurtu since that was where she left off. Um, the, the very interesting thing about Mukurtu is um, it was developed in collaboration with a number of different indigenous communities. And so the permissions are really culturally attuned. And so the permissions might be based on uh, what group you belong to, whether certain information is only shared during certain seasons. Um, so, so there are ways to build an archives that is, you know, partially fully publicly accessible because that's what you want to do, and then partially bifurcated into these different areas of access based on um, your own identity and and your belonging to that group or 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 the point um, at which that sharing becomes appropriate. Um, and so that's been really interesting work. Um, part of building an archives in Mukurtu is, is really outlining and explaining the protocols for um, that kind of access and engagement. Um, and, and that I think is maybe an area where the sensitivity is built into the platform um, some of the other platforms we use, there are ways to address sensitivity, but it it's sort of a, a post facto after the fact kind of uh, layer that we add um, to a platform that was designed to be fully open. And, and so it's really interesting, I think, to be to be thinking about how we deal with those things technically, sometimes by building them with sensitivity in mind, and then sometimes trying to address issues of sensitivity after the fact. Um, I, I don't work in the archives, so I'm afraid to speak on the archives behalf. Um, I do work very closely with these platforms, but um, Bianca, I would love to defer to you. Or now that Veronica's back, Veronica, I just talked a bit more about Mukutu. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in, Megan. Just, sure. you know, as part of the archival team, we've been working very closely um, with all the participants. So even though we have technological tools that might you know, satisfy some of these requirements, um, for our participants, we're also making sure that we are in conversation about <clears throat> what material materials they want to share and how they want to share them. So, depending on the archival option that each participant um, chooses for creating their digital archive, uh, we have been in conversation about how best to share that material and who it is most important to share it with. Um, but there are also elements of this project that follow traditional archival practices. And um, in that regard, just because we're creating a digital archive um, and we're archiving these projects, we aren't necessarily making every single 
um, piece of content in that archive available to the public if it's not safe to do so, if it doesn't make sense to do so. And, and that doesn't mean that that content isn't available to researchers and communities um, to access. They'll just be a different set of protocols to do so. Thank you so much for that. And, and maybe that is sort of at the heart of what so many of you all are, are working on and something that I see as a point of intersection among your work, right? That there's a constant need to listen to the, the many different communities, right? That inhabit this space and to have a, you know, a great level of humility, which that's, that's such a part of the archiving work. Um, and I can see as part of you all's advocacy and artistic practice as well. And it was beautiful to witness and to see. I, I believe that we are out of time in terms of the Q&A. Uh, and I'm just seeing thank yous in, in the Q&A and the chat. And so I will reiterate that by saying thank you. Gracias to everyone, to our panelists, to our participants for being with us at, uh, for this conversation today. And I know that I am deeply looking forward to seeing the digital archives that come out of this project and to being able to use them as we go forward. Thank you all. Don't forget to take the survey for the 50 people that are still here. Yeah, if you're still here, we would love your feedback on this event. We will be having more events uh, to continue highlighting the projects of people who are reclaiming the border narrative and um, so that you can get information about the digital archive and the digital archive website when it launches. Um, and also to continue connecting and, and continue sparking collaborations and questions and dialogue. So, Thank you so much again for anyone who's still here for joining us, to our moderator, to the panelists for sharing their projects and insights with us, um, to our interpreters, Mercedes and Ron, for their support and their work, and again, to the Ford Foundation and all of the Reclaiming the Border Narrative partners. Um, yeah, uh, we hope to see you all again. Thank you so much.